Well, we're looking here again to Romans tonight, and we're looking at the eight characteristics of a functionally mature Christian. What does a functionally mature Christian look like? And we are on the fourth one tonight here in verse 10, where Paul says, Making regress, request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. And of course, this is telling us that Paul was submissive to the will of God. No Christian, no functionally mature Christian will ever be successful in any kind of ministry uh, ever until he has submitted his will to the will of God. You will not understand the Bible until you have submitted your will to the will of God. When we talk about full surrender, we're talking about submitting of one's will to the will of God. And unfortunately, we have uh, much teaching in these latter days that this is only for a few people who really need to be fully surrendered to Christ. No, that's not true. Every Christian is to be perfected, and it really is the battle of the Christian life. Again, like I said this morning, the biggest enemy to the Christ life is our life. We, our, our sinful nature. And we, we create most of the problems and then try to blame it on to Satan. He probably uh, is the cause of most of, our, he's the cause of the original uh, fall of mankind and our sin nature. That's a seed he put in us. But uh, we need to take more credit for what we are and come to God with it. And then submit to his will. That is the first issue. So uh, we're going to go over to John 7 tonight. To know God's word is to know God's will. Let me say that one more time. To know God's word is to know God's will. So if I want to know God's will, what do I have to do? I study God's word. Uh, people tell me, what's God's word, or what's God's will in this? I, I said, well, have you asked him to show it to you in his word? Because if God's going to reveal his word to you, or his will to you, he's going to do it through his word. So to know God's word is to know God's will, but before God illuminates his word to the understanding of a believer, the believer must commit to doing whatever God will reveal before it is revealed. So I'm not just studying the Bible to get an intellectual knowledge. I'm, one of, I'm studying the Bible to find out what God wants me to, to how, how he wants me to live. But I have to commit to doing what God teaches me to do before God reveals it to me. And the attitude of submission must be present before Illumination will be given. Now, if that's a fact, and we'll see in a moment that it is, how important is full surrender to the Christian life? So I invite you to stand. We're going to read verse 14 through 17 of John 7 tonight. I have a word of prayer. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? He'd never gone to a rabbinical school. He'd never been trained in the law. Well, because he didn't need to be trained in the law. He wrote the law. So he is the author of it. Jesus answered them. Now, they, I don't think that they were asking him the question. They were just making a general specific inquiry. Uh, you know, how does this guy know all this stuff? Uh, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now look at this. If any man will to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He's going to know the doctrine. What is the requirement? Well, you must will to do his will. 
if you will, to do his will, that's submission. If you will do his will, before you hear it, God will teach it to you. Uh, and you're going to know that it's the word of God. There's going to be that process that takes place. Now, we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll talk about this. Again, Father, tonight as we come before you, before the teaching of your word, I declare my absolute dependence upon you to present the truth. Lord, I'm just a sinner. And I ask, Lord, that you would hide me behind your cross and let your people see Jesus. I pray as well tonight that each person here would will to do your will right now and that, Lord, you'd open up their understanding and then they would experience what this portion of Scripture is speaking of this evening. I pray, Lord, uh, that you would work as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I've told this story a number of times, but I was getting ready to prepare for sermons on a, on a Sunday. And it was a Saturday night for preparing for Sunday morning. And I, I went down to the church uh, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I was uh, reading my Bible, looking for something that God would just lay upon my heart. I don't do that anymore. I preach through text. But this was a particular special week, and uh, I wanted something special from the Lord. And so I was just reading from my Bible, and now it is uh, about, I don't know, 12 o'clock or so at night, and I've got nothing. And so I got down on my knees beside my desk, and I said, Lord, there are going to be some people coming here tomorrow, and you know I don't like to wing it. Uh, Lord, I need something. I need something from you. And I just pray that, Lord, you give me something for these people. I got up off of my knees, opened up my Bible, just kind of opened it up like that and began to read. And literally, I could not write down things fast enough as God was giving them to me. It was coming that quickly. And uh, this verse came to mind. This is the way it's supposed to work. God will open, literally turn the lights on, open up the lights of our understanding. Look, folks. Let me just be real honest with you. Uh, I think that this is something every Christian ought to do before he does his own devotions and especially before preaching. There ought to be a time of preparing our hearts and making this decision uh, before we begin to hear the word of God taught and preached. For years as I went in and did uh, revival meetings in churches, one of the first things I did for the first few meetings was to get people to do what this verse of Scripture said. I would read this verse of Scripture and I said, Now, before we do any preaching today or tonight, throughout the week, will you commit to doing whatever God reveals to you from his word? And if I only had a few people who raised their hands for that, I knew we probably weren't going to see God do much that week. But if we had a large percentage of the congregation raise their hands, I knew God was going to work that week. We had a group of people that really wanted. Now, God's going to work <laughs> either way. But I always say it's rather to have somebody working with you rather than you working against them. And, uh, of course, God did work in, in, in those times. So perhaps the best example of the attitude of submission to God's word and revealed will is found in the little book of Ruth. I love the little book of Ruth. And there's a portion of scripture in the book of Ruth that's often used in a woman's wedding vows. It is what the Moabite Ruth, who was a priestess, by the way, of the Moabite God, um, which means that she was a pretty wicked woman before she got saved. Both her and her sister were priests of the Moabite God. But they married the two sons of Elimelech and, and, and Naomi, Malon and Chilion. Um, Malon and Chilion, they're, of course, in Moab because they're, along with Elimelech and Naomi, 
because of there was a famine in the land of Israel. And God had was chastising the children of Israel. Remember, he's, it was a blessing and curse. The Mosaic law was a blessing and curse. If they obeyed the law and, and uh, stayed sanctified, God would bless them. It would rain on their crops and their animals would produce. But if they did not, God would curse them. And that meant that their animals would not produce. They'd be sick. There'd be sickness, uh, plague, and their crops would not grow. And so now there's famine in the land of Israel. And instead of staying under the chastisement of God, uh, Abimelech, Naomi, take their two sons, Malon and Chilion, and they run away from God's chastisement into Moab, a pagan country, because they had food there. And they did stay their lives to some degree. But in that time, God continued his chastisement because Abimelech, which means God is my king, <laughs> dies. Malon and Chilion, which means sickness and consumption, that's what their names mean. How do you like to name your kids that? <laughs> but uh, they die uh, in Israel after they've taken two pagan wives. They shouldn't have done that. That was more disobedience. So obedient, disobedience upon disobedience. And Naomi finds out that there is uh, bread back in Israel. And she's from Bethlehem, which means a house of what? House of bread. <laughs> So she goes back uh, and she's heading back to Israel because she has kinsmen redeemers there as a kinsman. So she's going back and she'd find a kinsman to take care of her for the rest of her life, which was her right under Jewish law. Uh, the two daughters, uh, Oprah and uh, Opa and uh, uh, Ruth, they decided originally to go with her, but Orpah, Orpah turns back. And she decides not to go. But this text that I'm going to read from Ruth 1.16 is Ruth's commitment. Her commitment to the will of God. And it says here, Oprah kissed her mother-in-law Naomi, but Ruth claved unto her. Oprah leaves. Ruth cleaves. That's a difference now. Oprah leaves. Ruth cleaves. Now look at this, verse 16. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee. Ruth said, don't go with me. I've got, I've got nothing there. I, I don't have anything in Israel. I'm going to have to, uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, under a kinsman redeemer and essentially glean in the fields all the rest of my life. So Ruth said, no, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. Now here's those, those words that we have in the marriage vows. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more so also, also if aught but death part thee and me. That's where all of our marriage vows come today. Right from that text. So what is this text? This is a submission text. This is a repentance text. This is a commitment text. Uh, it is a lordship text. There's so many things that we can preach from this text. It's there. I deal with it quite extensively in, in the book back there on the back table. Um, I can't even remember the title of it. But uh, it's a, one of my most popular books. Uh, available. Well, submission is a central characteristic of a person with a servant's heart. I've never known a person who was genuine servant who wasn't submitted to the will of God. Now, let me give you a few verses of scripture. Now, first of all, I'm going to read Ephesians 5.21. It is a universal principle. Now we can go down a little bit later in that text and we'll see that wives are submit themselves unto their husbands. But this text is not about wives to their husbands or husbands to their wives. Those are two different commandments. This is about every believer. 
In chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, this is a commitment of the church. We are, we are submitting one to another. That begins. And sometimes I want to go to somebody and they're having a fight, a disagreement. I'll say, well, let me ask you a simple question. Are you doing what Ephesians 5.21 says? <laughs> Doesn't sound like it to me. Are you submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God? James 4, 7, again, here another verse of scripture tells us first of all that we are to submit yourself therefore to God. Yes, resist the devil and he will flee from you, but how does that begin? Don't expect the devil to, re to, to don't be expect to resist the devil and have him flee from you if you have not submitted yourself therefore to God. That's where the power comes from. The only reason he will flee from you is because you've already submitted yourself to God. I always say this. When you submit yourself to God, you get right behind him. and You get right behind the Lord and he stands between you and the devil. And uh, you can peek around. He says, okay, go ahead. Do what you want to do. <laughs> and, uh, uh, instead, Satan's gonna, he's just going to run away. Literally, that's what that means. He's going to run away. Uh, so, look at Hebrews 13, 17. Now, here's another way that God has ordained in the church. He says, obey them, verse 17, that have the rule over you. That's the pastors and leaders of the church. Submit yourselves to, to them, for, for they watch for your soul. Now, I'm going to some doctors here in the next few days. I've been going there for long time about this cancer and all this nonsense going on but uh, when I go there I'm not going to sit around to argue with them uh, I'm going to trust them they know a lot more about it than I do this guy that's doing my radiology this doctor's been doing it for 50 years 50 years Can you imagine he's seen this stuff coming from probably from leeches yet back in his first time of his ministry or a doctorate I'm not going to, I'm going to trust them what they're doing. Now, granted, there are probably some doctors I wouldn't trust, but uh, I've, I've run into a few of them. But uh, these guys I trust. They know what they're doing. And uh, really, that's what they're asking you to do. Well, you, you know, they're coming. Are you going there? You're going to say, well, can you trust me with this? Well, yeah. You're the ones that know your stuff. And, and why? Well, the same thing's true of your pastor. You know, if he loves you, if he's not there for filthy lucre's sake, and he's not, uh, you know, going to pull the punches with you, he's going to always tell you the truth, no matter even if it hurts. Uh, that's what my job is. And so, submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls. They're looking out for you. Uh, if I go to the doctor and he says, well, I don't want to really tell him that what's going to happen because, you know, he's going to get discouraged and, and, uh, that's not going to make him feel good today that I tell him he's got cancer. That's probably going to not make, not going to have a good day today. <laughs> well, I don't care. I want him to tell me the truth. You don't want your pastor not to tell you the truth. They're watching for your souls. Why? As they that must give account, that they must do it with joy. They may do it with joy, not with grief. But that's unprofitable for you. And that's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. So number five, the fifth characteristic is Paul was a communal Christian. Uh, Romans 1, 11 through 12 says, for, long, for I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, he made himself available and accountable to the assembly of the saints. It is a tragedy when I see people who do not understand how much they need the church and how much the church needs them. This is what Paul is talking about. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, we have a group of professing Christians who are about to abandon the church and go back to the temple. 
Now they're going to not be loyal to their pastor anymore. They're not going to be loyal to the church anymore. They're going to go back and begin to practice the Mosaic Covenant rather than the New Testament and the New Covenant. So the Word of God commands them in verse 23, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he that is, he is faithful that promise. Always hang on to Jesus. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Otherwise, stay in the church. Don't go back to the temple. Stay in the church. Why? Because we are to provoke uh, unto love and to good works. We, we do that to one another. That's why we, we are here to encourage one another. And by example, we live that manner of love. I'm encouraged every Sunday by every one of you, not just by you attending, but by, your, by the very fact that uh, you are who you are. That is encouraging me. I'm encouraged, I'm encouraged every Sunday that all, although in a very difficult world, in a very dark period of history, I don't have to stand alone. That is encouraging to me. I'm encouraged to know that people pray for me. And you ought to be encouraged that you can come here and people get to know who you are and you keep them updated on what's going on in your life and know that they're praying for you. Not because it's an obligation, but because they genuinely love you. That's the way the church ought to be. So he says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. Some were doing that. They had forsaken the church for the temple. But exhorting one another. What does that mean? Encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And of course it, they thought the return of Christ was imminent. And I do too. It was and it is. <laughs> so understanding the interdependency of believers is basic to the Christian life. Only immature Christians think they can get by alone. <laughs> that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard anybody say in my life. And I've had people say, I don't need, I don't need the church. I want to say, you're an idiot. <laughs> I don't, because I'm supposed to encourage them in love. I say, well, that's not the brightest decision you've ever made. But uh, it's your decision. You get to do it if you want to do it. That's the way you live. But just remember this. We'll be right here. Uh, if the Lord allows us to be here, when you're all done with your foolishness. So there is no such thing as a Robinson Crusoe Christian in the scripture. There isn't. God hasn't left you alone on a desert island. Uh, you, get, you, you, are, you have people all around you. And the body metaphor does not refer to some ambiguous universal church. Although there is a mystical and invisible body, the Greek word ekklesia is usually translated church is best defined as an assembly. And the call to assembly was the same thing that they did when they called people to the temple on the Sabbath. They blew the shofar, the trump. And the trump is of course how God's going to assemble the mystical church one day. That's the church of the firstborn, the General Assembly of Hebrews chapter 10. But the mystical church will not assemble until the trump of Christ calls them to do so from their graves in resurrection and glorification of, of dead and by translation and glorification of the living. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14. Now I, I, I want you to underline a couple words as we read this text. For... What's the next word? If we believe, that's conditional, that Jesus died and rose again. Otherwise, that is essential to the doctrine of salvation. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's part of the gospel. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus, that's those who have died, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, 
that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, that's Jesus, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, that's a call to assembly, and the dead in Christ shall rise in first. That trump is going to bring him right up out of the grave. Now that's bodily resurrection. Their, their spirits and souls are already in heaven with Christ. When he, when Christ was resurrected and glorified, uh, the, he led captivity captive, and the Bible says today to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. But there still is awaiting the redemption of the body. This is what this is. Romans chapter 8 is redemption of the body. So the dead in Christ shall rise first. In Christ are critical terms. That is only those who have been baptized by the Spirit into the new Genesis. The new Genesis is the um, procreation of all those who are born again by faith and are in Christ Jesus. They shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So that's where the first reunion is going to take place. Jesus is not coming to the earth. He's going to be up in the air someplace and we'll meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. This isn't the same time, the second coming, when his feet touch the Mount of Olives. There's a whole other bunch of circumstances that happen there. So in verse 18, we are told, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is going to be the assembly of the mystical or the general assembly of the church. General assembly is a general ecclesia. Now, is that going to be physical or just spiritual? Well, they're going to have new glorified bodies, right? So there's going to be a physical aspect to that church as well. So not just spiritual. Today, the church is local. Not local, it is that too, in many cases. So the question we ask here, are you part of a body? Are you, a, are you communal? That's what a, a Christian is. We are communal. The metaphorical, uh, the word the body, refers to a unity of parts, Right? If you were to ask somebody to show you a skeleton, you'd see a whole bunch of bones all connected together. If you were to look at the next level of that, you'd see muscles on those bones connected by sinews and ligaments. All of that would connect all of those muscles. And covering that all up is some skin. Flowing through it is miles and miles and miles of blood veins that feed those muscles with the nutrients that come from your digestive system oxygen from your lungs and by the way that all evolved <laughs> we, this is crazy to think about what people can come up with uh, professing themselves to be wise they become fools so a, a human body is muscles connected to bones controlled and harmoniously directed by a brain energized by breath from the lungs and blood from the heart a human body functions as one unit Fingers do not rebel against the hands or the hands from the arms. They function as directed by the head. This describes the complexity of the local church in the body metaphor. A local church is composed of numerous people, each with a free will. <laughs> if carnality reigns, people are not submissive to the will of God. Doctrine is ignored and the spirit of God resisted. That local church will be powerless, chaotic mess until uh, unless uh, uh, useless to the head. That's just not going to be functional. Every individual must be fully united, accountable to one another, and yielded to the head. This defines a communal Christian. And there aren't there's no such thing in the Bible as a Christian disconnected from a body. Just not there, nowhere to be found. Uh, look here to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is one of the body texts. Romans 12 is another one. 
Now look at this. This is this general assembly, this mystical body of Christ that's being built. Now it's broken down today in local assembly, local assemblies. But he says, for by one spirit we all are we all baptized into one body. That's a body metaphor. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Lots of local churches. Lots of individual Christians. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? No. That's a rebel foot. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, am I not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? That's a rebel ear. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Otherwise, the body is to function as a harmonious unit. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as he hath pleased. They have a function to do in the body. And God set them in. That's the vocational calling of, of every believer. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, but much more these members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. That's the parts that we cover up. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the bodies together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the body, the members, should have the same care one for another. Now remember this verse of scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 25. Next time somebody says to you, well, I don't believe in church membership. <laughs> well, Nowhere in the Bible does it talk about church membership. Well, there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. The body has members. Now, how the church structures itself, there's some liberty given to them in that. And, and uh, how it examines all of that, there's some liberty. But they were commanded to do it. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. I remember years ago I had an ingrown toenail. And I was a floor layer in those days. And uh, so you're dragging your feet behind you. And literally that thing would throb and bleed and just was terribly infected. I had to go in and have surgery on it. But... Uh, the rest of my body didn't know there was another part there. Everything in my brain was focused on that one thing. And I'd have to force myself to get down on my knees. I'd have to force myself to walk. Because it just aggravatingly hurt constantly. And, uh, you know, in those days you didn't uh, uh, say, Well, boss, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, doing real good today. I'm sure you'll pay me anyway. No, you didn't work. You didn't get paid. I had family, and and uh, my family liked to eat and have a roof over their head, and so I went to work with it anyway. That's where the body is, you know. One part of one part of the body hurts; the the rest of the body focuses upon it. If one part of the body is rejoicing, the rest of the body rejoices with it. Right? That's the way it's supposed to work. But God has ordained the local church for a specific purpose with specific goals. And teaching what God says about church and a believer's responsibility to attend to be perfected, Ephesians 4.12, and to serve in sanctified ministry, the work of the ministry, while living in a synchronized accountability to every other member of the body is almost non-existent in these last days. Why? Because 2 Timothy 3.1, Paul says, in the last days, men shall be lovers of their own self, and they'll not endure sound doctrine. 
the church is rapidly falling apart, and uh, we're, we're trying pe people who think say they are their church trying to keep people coming. They want to lose people. The kids leaving the church and uh, going into the world, so they just bring the world to the church. That's not the church. That's not the body of Christ. Don't call that the body of Christ. People say, well, we're the body of Christ. I say, no, you're not. That's a disgusting example of carnality and worldliness. Don't, don't call yourself the body of Christ. That's blasphemy. When the doctrine of Christ is taught according to the word of God, the doctrine of the church is taught according to the word of God, that doctrine is argued against, and those teaching uh, it in orthodoxy are vilified and labeled as legalists. Charlie Swindoll said that if somebody ever tells you that you are required to go to church, you're talking to a legalist. Look, I don't, I, you're nobody's, you know, God wants you to go to church, but the, the point is, it's not that you have to, the point is you get to. That's a gift. That's, that's God's gift to you. And you ought to get on your knees and thank God that you got a local church. I know you folks do, but not everybody does. They, they take the church for granted. Look with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Boy, I got Patty excited over there. <laughs> she woke Connie up. That was unfortunate. She just got another nap. There she goes again. That's what she's doing to me today. I was sitting there sleeping away, and she started start talking to me. And, and I said, honey, I was sleeping. She said, oh, I'm sorry. And five minutes later, she started talking to me again. I'd be sleeping. Now, you apologize to Connie for waking her up. <laughs> oh, we can have a little fun here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. This is the doctrine of the church in a nutshell right here. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended upon high, he let captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That is uh, uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That, but uh, the gifts, of course, are spiritual gifts. Um, Romans chapter 12, uh, 3 through 8 are the spiritual gifts, the service gifts. Not the sign gifts, the service gifts. Verse 9, now that he ascended, which is, uh, which is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill or fulfill all things. A rule. Now, here he says in verse 11, after the parentheses in. Now, this is picking up in verse 8. Uh, after he says he gave gifts unto men, and now he talks about these gifts. That he gives to men. The men are other Christians. And he gives gifted men to the church. So he gave some apostles. Some prophets. Now there aren't any of those today. He gave some evangelists. Some pastors and teachers. Those are the gifts God has given today. These are the gifts that God has given. For the perfecting of the saints. Um, this is the equipping. Or the maturing of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. This is for in and through the church. Now the church functions not always within the church house. But for years I have appealed to people. I said, well, look, if you have some questions, you don't have to wait until Sunday to ask them. I'm available. You know, I, um, I have an office. In those days I had an office at the church. I, in my home is open. We have coffee and all kinds of refreshments there. My wife uh, and I both get dressed practically every day, and uh, we would welcome you to come. Uh, so, uh, you know, it doesn't have to always take place in the church house, but we're available. And sometimes some of the more uh, private questions that people have are very specific about sometimes very what they think are embarrassing issues. Uh, I don't want to talk to their pastor about it. By the way, it doesn't make any difference to me. I tell you, I've, uh, uh, I've been doing this a long time. There's nothing really that I haven't heard in, in uh, 50 years. You know, every now and then I get surprised with some new new twist on it. But uh, uh, you're not going to surprise me. And I'm not going to be surprised that you are involved in something that you ought not to be. It's pretty much common 
I've dealt with deacons. I've dealt with other pastors and helped help them with these kind of issues. So these are these are things that are common to the body of Christ. So it doesn't always have to be done in the church house. Now notice these people are there, are given for the edifying of the body of Christ, verse 13, till or until we all come in the unity of the faith. We keep at it until we all come in the unity of the faith. One faith, one, one, one baptism. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. That's a mature, equipped man. Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait. We're perfected, we're equipped, we're mature. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is ahead even Christ. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Not just one person doing all of this. Every part of the body works together to bring individuals to perfection. And thereby making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The sixth character of a mature Christian is Paul was a purposeful Christian. He was goal-oriented, verse 13. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you. Paul set goals. Learn to set long-term goals and set short-term goals to reach them. A long-term goal, Emerson is trying to memorize Pa. He's going to get to the long-term goal by making short-term goals, right? And it's incremental. Short-term goals are incremental achievements. But you won't have, you won't achieve incremental goals if you don't set those goals. Paul says this in Philippians 3.8. He says, Yea, doubtless I count all things, but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And to count them but dung. He says, these things were not important to me that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, a righteousness which is of God by faith, that's righteousness gifted, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, otherwise a willingness to die is death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He says, that's my goal. That's where I'm heading for and I'm looking forward to it. Verse 12. Not as though I'd already attained. Otherwise, it's not going to come to me because I deserve it. Either we're already perfect. He still was struggling. But I follow. That word follow actually means to pursue or chase after if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. Otherwise, that I can get as much of, of Christ as Christ has got me. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. All my past failures and successes. They'll do you nothing today. And reaching forth, literally stretching myself forth under those things which are before me. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm reaching, I'm stretching myself out for it. It's always just outside of my reach inside this body, but I preach for it, I press for it. Let us, therefore, all of us, as many as be perfect, otherwise we're mature. Be thus minded, and if in, if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. And pray for it. Ask God to reveal it to you. Now the mark of Philippians 3.14, Paul admonishes all Christians to press towards his mature life in Christ. It's a Christ life. It's also the prize. The prize is in heaven. The prize is being like Christ. That's in this life. 
when we get to glory, we don't have to pray for that anymore because that's when we get it. Then the seventh one is Paul was an obligated Christian. He was responsible to the obligations of sonship. Chapter 1 verse 14. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He was a debtor. He was obligated. When we accept Christ, we become both sons of God by spiritual regeneration, being born again, and ambassadors for Christ. Only God's sons are God's ambassadors. Now, he only has one begotten son. But he has many born-again sons, children. Being an ambassador details the responsibility of sonship. And while we remain in the bodies of this world, we are the sons of God. We are his voice, the children, the technon of God. John 1, 11, we all know this verse of scripture. He says, he came unto his own. And... Uh, uh, his own temple and his own people received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, right, or privilege to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of God, uh, will of man, but of God. They were regenerated. <clears throat> God recreated them into something new and different. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become, are, are become perfect tense. New, not neos, kahinas. Not new of the same kind, but new of a new kind. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us his sons, his children, the ministry of reconciliation to wit. Here's what it is. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That Now, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Every single one of us. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Instead of Christ, we pray, we plead with you, be you reconciled to God. That's a message. That's a ministry of reconciliation. We're out pleading with the world to be reconciled to God. John 20, verse 21. Our time is gone, but I want to finish this up. Then said Jesus to them again, peace unto you as, underline that word, as my father has sent me. Okay, just like that. Even so send I you. He sent him to die. He sent him to evangelize the world. He sent him to make disciples so there would be a continuation of people preaching Christ after they died. So as the Father sent me, even so I sent you to do the same thing. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto, unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, now this is not the Holy Ghost. If you look up this in Webster's Dictionary, it means something different than most people think. The reason why it's a ghost here is because this is the spirit of a being who lived but is now dead. So those beings that Jesus led, led captivity captive and, and took home with him, that was the ghost of those people, their spirit and soul. They're not wandering around. They're not ghosts wandering around the world today. The, the ghosts of the dead are either in Hades bound or they're in the presence of God. The ghosts aren't wandering around the world today. Demons are. But this is the, the ghost of Christ. And so he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. He's saying, receive ye my spirit, my ghost. And he says, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto you. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So sonship refers to the position of an adult son with the responsibilities of that position. And the word adoption, Galatians 4 or 5, you're going to go over there, is a Greek word, hoeothesis, uh, ethesa. The, the word is a composite of hu, huis, huis, 
which means son, and tithemi, which means to place in an upright position. Together, they refer to the placement of sons into an adult position of responsibility and trust. There was a time when dad would say to me, you know, uh, uh, I, I always remember that passing moment of time with my older brothers when my dad would say, hey, here, son, here's the keys. That was a moment of passing, right? He trusted us with something. That was precious to him. That was, you know, we didn't have much for cars in those days, but that's how dad got to work every day. And he let you use that. Boy, that was major trust for God to do that. So we took that uh, real, we were real cautious about that when God let us, or when dad let us have that. Well, that's what's going on here. This is passing. And it's told us here in Genesis or Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive might, subjunctive, might receive the adoption of sons, the placement as adult sons with adult responsibilities and adult expectations. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and of a son and an heir of God through Christ. This is the transition from the Mosaic covenant to the new covenant. We have greater responsibility, higher expectations. It is the God-ordained responsibility of a son to honor his father and his mother. And every Jewish child who was taught the law was taught what this meant. We don't teach it today. I shouldn't say we teach it. We don't teach it. Most people don't teach it today. So to honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, Exodus 12, 12, or 20, 12, was to live in such a manner as to bring honor to the family name and glory to one's parents. If a child rebelled against his parents under the law, the parents had the right to have the child stoned rather than to bring disgrace to their family name. And we don't have that right today. We know we're not under the law. Might simplify a lot of problems, but... Uh, that's not what God wants us to do today. Honor is from the Hebrew word kebab, a kebab, uh, meaning to cause honor to be brought or to, to give uh, someone honor or to bring glory to their name. And honor thy father and thy mother, uh, Exodus twenty twelve, And of course the promise is thy days may be long upon the land, uh, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So it's easy to understand that a son honored his father and his mother by bringing honor to the heritage of the family name and to fame the family in any manner or immoral or disgraceful living was, was to dishonor that name. And as a child of God, every Christian should desire to bring glory to the name of God and never dishonor to the name of God. But yet that was what's going on. Now the last one, eight. Paul was a prepared Christian. Verse 15. He says, I am ready. So much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. He was ready to witness. Mature Christians are constantly sharpening their swords. Did you get that now? Mature Christians are constantly sharpening their swords. I still spend, I probably spend more time studying today than I did when I was going to seminary and college. I spend more time studying today than I did then. Why? Well, there's a lot more I want to know and my life is short. <laughs> there's a lot of things I want to be able to know and teach. But mature Christians here, of course, are constantly sharpening their swords. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thy self approved unto God. Who's supposed to do it? Study. Study to show yourself. Don't wait for somebody to teach you. Get into the word of God. Why? Because you're a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You need to rightly divide the, divide the word of truth. 
Mature Christians prepare themselves to confront a world that is hostile to God. And the world is getting ever increasingly hostile. Yeah, that doesn't mean we say, well, I'm going to go hide in my house someplace and, and build a bunker in my basement. Mature Christians are perfected to do the work of the ministry. They study to ensure doctrinal orthodoxy and so that they can discern and defend what God teaches against false teachers. They seek to live the, the truths they know, orthopraxy, in the power of the indwelling spirit of Christ. They are faithful because they love the Lord and live their lives under the sun to his glory. And so they take 1 Peter 3.15, very serious. And it begins with, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's a first step to preparing yourself to be ready. Set apart the Lord God in your hearts. He lives there. Make sure it is a holy place. Make sure you keep it clean, sanctified. <laughs> Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. One is the foundation, the next is the cause. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I believe this describes Paul. Have you checked off your checklist here and said, how am I doing on this? See, what happens in this checklist of the functionally matured, you say, well, here, I've got to work at this. Not that you have, you know, very seldom we have every one of them that we say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really good at this. Might have one or two, but most of them we got to work at. And these are here in my margin of my Bible to remind me. And I, I do this checklist every now and then. Here, here's some, I need to work at this again. I need to just spend some time on this and think about this and pray about this. Do better. Eight characteristics of a functionally mature Christian. Learn them and make some daily and weekly and monthly and yearly evaluations of how you're doing and how you are advancing in those aspects of your life. Now, everyone here I know has some weak spots. Now, I, I have some weak spots and I'm working at them. And every one of us have to work at them. This is our own areas of our own life that we need to deal with. Examine yourself carefully. You know, you need to get saved first, but if you're saved, these are the things, these are the growth points of our lives. So look at them and then do what you can. Father, tonight as we close our time together, we pray for those who need to get saved. And uh, we pray that you would open their hearts to understanding and convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And pray, Father, that... Uh, for those who are listening here in the room and those who are listening online, that Lord, they take these matters very serious and begin to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.